Isn't it interesting how at the beginning of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Ukraine was deemed successful because they lost a bunch of territory, but not all of it. Then this past summer during Ukraine's counteroffensive, that was deemed unsuccessful because Ukraine did retake some territory, but not enough. It's kind of confusing, right? How is success losing territory and failure gaining territory, but not enough. This all comes down to the expectations that are placed on one side or another in war. And Foreign Affairs recently put together a great article that I thought was worth running through, talking to this not just in Ukraine, but also in Gaza. They say outside observers, both experts and lay people alike, do not evaluate military results by simply tallying up the battlefield gains and losses. Instead, they compare those results to their expectations. As a result, states can lose territory and still be deemed winners if they overperform. States can take land and be labeled losers if they underdeliver. The resulting conclusions about the winners and losers, however skewed, can even rebound and shape the battlefield. Ukraine, for example, lost territory during the initial weeks of Russia's invasion, but Kyiv's unexpectedly resolute defense earned it widespread Western assistance, which helped it to liberate numerous cities in the following months. And this is tough. And, and the reason I wanted to run through this article was not to provide an answer. You're not going to hear this, uh, you know, watch this video, listen to this, or read the article in its entirety and have the answers to something. It's more just something to keep in mind as we're consuming information about war and conflict, trying to understand how things are shaping out and what they might look like in the future, trying to get a grasp of what our expectations are, either intentional or not, and what the expectations are of others who are assessing progress on the battlefield. They say, at first, it might seem like the key to success in war is to exude great confidence about victory. In wartime, after all, optimism can be a force multiplier, whereas defeatism can be contagious. If everyone thinks one side will win a battle, it really might prevail in a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. There is some aspect to this. If I would, I'm hard-pressed to say that pure confidence will ever win a battle and overcome all of the other aspects of the fight, but you have to avoid that defeatism at all costs. Right, a military that goes into a fight thinking they're going to lose before the first shot is fired is a recipe for disaster. You cannot have that. So it's understanding that you want to hype up the troops and say, we got a chance. We're going to do this. We are going to prevail. It's a question then of, of where is that line? Avoiding the defeatism, but how far until you get into that aspect of unrealistic expectations that cannot be met. So you're setting your forces up, setting your country up for failure unintentionally. One of the examples they point to here, I think is a great example on this front, is the Tet Offensive during the Vietnam War. Leading up to this, President Johnson had been going on this progress campaign to show just how the United States was winning in Vietnam. The war was all but won. We were on the verge of, of total victory. And then the Viet Cong, along with some NVA elements, kicked off this Tet Offensive in January 1968 that tactically was a major loss. The number of casualties that the two sides sustained were, were disproportionately in favor of the United States and South Vietnamese forces. We killed a lot of Viet Cong and a lot of NBA. But that attack was so widespread across the entire country that it kind of shook the American people and said, I thought we were winning this war. If we were winning, how did the enemy just kick off this major attack, coordinated attack all across the country? So it's just a, a good example and started to, arguably, led to the eventual evacuation and withdrawal of U.S. forces from Vietnam. So just an example there, a historic example of how outsized expectations can kind of shape the battlefield in a negative way. Then diving into some examples here around the war in Ukraine, they said when Russia failed to seize the capital, Western countries were impressed by Ukraine's performance, which encouraged them to provide more material aid. In turn, Ukraine launched a series of successful counteroffensives that liberated roughly half the territory Moscow had taken. But in the process, Kyiv was saddled with great expectations. Western observers began suggesting that Ukraine might somehow drive a bedraggled Russia out of the territory it took in 2022, and perhaps even the land that Moscow seized in 2014. For anybody who's following this war, I think you probably can remember that. We watched Ukraine that was supposed to crumble, was not supposed to be able to stand up to the might of the Russian military, hold their own. And then in the fall, started to push back and take a little bit of territory, big chunks of territory in the east especially. And all of a sudden, that this narrative came about that Ukraine might not just be able to hold, they might be able to push Russia entirely out of their country. There were even speculation that they could cause the collapse of Russia entirely. And you can see how this, this conversation about expectations starts to take form 
and how some of this was just unrealistic from the get. They say these expectations, however, were completely unrealistic. Russia incurred tens or even hundreds of thousands of casualties, but the country was still much stronger than Ukraine. Its GDP was nine times the size of its neighbors, and its population was over three times as large. After suffering setbacks, Moscow mobilized more forces, spent months laying mines and preparing other defenses, and learned to use drones more effectively. As a result, when Ukraine launched a highly anticipated offensive in June 2023, it faced fierce resistance and its efforts quickly stalled out. Again, some of that expectation that was didn't have to be placed on the Ukrainian forces. What if the expectation, I hope this is kind of a theme throughout this, is what if we temper those expectations in any war, whether it's, it's Ukraine, Russia, Israel, Gaza, or the United States and someone else, if we can temper those expectations, are we more likely to succeed in the long term? Right? What if Ukraine's counteroffensive would have been you know, much smaller in scope and the goals of that counteroffensive would not have been people talking about the liberation of Crimea and the collapse of the Russian military, but just restabilizing the lines in certain areas or taking strategic or tactically important areas of the front. You frame it in a whole different light and all of a sudden, you know, Ukraine is, is not necessarily chasing something that's out of the realm of possibility, but something very much within their grasp. You could then look back on it, depending how that plays out, and say it was a successful counteroffensive. But the way that it was shaped leading up to it, it's hard to look at that and say that in any way, shape, or form, it was effective. They say the darkened mood has translated into growing skepticism about providing assistance to Ukraine, which some are calling America's new forever war, which again, bring this back to the expectations. They say fighting Russia to a near standstill remains a massive achievement for Ukraine. There's so many still in this argument about whether or not we should provide and continue to provide military assistance to Ukraine, people saying it's a standstill. Well, in the grand scheme of things, Ukraine fighting Russia to a standstill is a massive accomplishment. Nobody expected that when this first kicked off. Right? That is an accomplishment, but that was not the expectation that so many placed on Ukraine. So much of the expectations were, again, about the liberation of all occupied territory since 2014 and possibly the collapse of Russia and Putin you know, falling from power. Again, expectations maybe not in line with what could be accomplished realistically. What if those expectations a year and more ago was set as, we're just going to try to make sure Russia doesn't take any more territory? That is within the realm of possibility, and at that point, we could look at this and say, Ukraine has been very successful on that front. How on earth are they continuing to hold the Russian military? Then shifting over to how this looks in Israel, which I think is, is, is a very interesting comparison, they say, when this conflict began, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made a grandiose promise that his country would, quote, crush and destroy Hamas, declaring that he would eradicate the group completely was a mistake. Hamas is amorphous, dispersed, and heavily armed, which means that it's almost impossible for Israel to abolish. Netanyahu's pledge makes it extremely difficult for Israel to be seen as the clear-cut winner of the war. When expectations and reality clash, crisis often follows. And there's been a lot of pushback on that recently, and you, you've, you've kind of seen some shifting in the Israeli public announcements of the war aims, because the complete eradication of Hamas, we don't have any good examples in recent memory where that exists, where an insurgent terrorist dispersed network is completely eliminated. I mean, right now, Hamas has has figures across the Middle East in places like the UAE, Egypt, uh, Lebanon. If they exist, technically, I mean, is Israel going to go after those leadership figures in the UAE? Because if they don't, then Hamas still exists, right? And still has funding. It still could pop up later. So again, the expectations. So if the, the complete destruction and elimination of Hamas is listed as a goal, and it's not a realistic goal, does that not set Israel up for failure in this war in some way, shape, or form? They say it's tempting for Netanyahu to use such rhetoric to rally support, signal resolve, and justify the investment of lives. But maximalist war aims and promises of triumph set, Israel, is set Israelis up for disappointment by suggesting that the only acceptable outcome is an outright triumph. Victory would require either removing Hamas entirely from Gaza or forcing the organization's surrender, neither of which is likely. And here we are recording this, uh, you know, what are we, six months into this war, and there's no clear sign that Hamas is on the verge of being completely dismantled. They've taken significant losses, no doubt. A lot of their personnel have been killed. A lot of their key leaders have been killed or captured. A lot of their military capabilities have been significantly degraded. But the organization still exists. 
So, so how much longer will Israel has to go at this pace to accomplish those maximalist war aims that Netanyahu has laid out? Would it have been more beneficial to kind of dial that back and instead of saying Hamas will be eliminated, saying we're going to significantly degrade Hamas's capabilities to where they can no longer carry out uh, you know, catastrophic attacks inside of Israeli territory? I don't know. I'm not a politician. I'm not Israeli. But they are hitting on, I think, a good point here where those maximalist aims can come back to bite you. They say Hamas, by contrast, benefits from this tyranny of expectations. As the weaker party of the conflict, observers may see its very survival as a kind of victory. And I don't know if you've seen this. I have in kind of monitoring the information space. There is a lot of talk about how Hamas is, is winning simply by the fact that they're still there. Or people point to how some of the key leaders have not been eliminated as a sign that Hamas is winning. I mean, the casualty figures... Uh, are, are, are steeply in favor of Israel at this point. Far more Hamas members have been killed than Israeli civilians and military. And it's not close. So there's very few areas you can look to in the tactical sense and say that Hamas is winning this war. But one of the places that people are doing that is saying, well, they still exist. Well, they're still there. And six months in, Israel has not been able to eliminate this threat. Therefore, Hamas is is winning or on the on the path to Victory. Again, it comes down to those expectations. Hamas was supposed to be wiped out very, very quickly. right? There's, they're no match for the might of the Israeli military, but they're still there. So this is a major challenge across the board. It's, it's not that anyone has gotten it right or wrong. I would say in this case, Hamas kind of fell into that category. Nobody was going to look at Hamas as the stronger of the two entities before the war. So just the, the nature of the conflict has them as the underdog to where their survival, in a sense, is a victory. And that same thing played out with Ukraine. Right? Ukraine was and always has been the underdog against Russia. Simply their survival and continuing to hold the lines in any way, shape, or form is viewed as a victory of sorts. So just, again, there's no answers that come out of this article, this video, my talking through it. I just think it's, it's a valuable thing to have in the back of our minds as we're assessing wars and trying to understand how they're shaking out, what the future might look like, is what are the expectations that we place on the various sides and what other commentators or analysts place on one military or the other. But that's all I've got for now. Of course, if you're interested in this or other national security subjects, be sure to check out our Substack linked in the description below. Substack is like a mix between a newsletter and a website. So we publish three to four articles there a week. You can sign up for free and those will be emailed directly to you. You can read them then on your phone, in your inbox, or come over to the Substack site and check them out. Uh, it's all sorts of different things, like Hezbollah's war chest, how they fund their military force, uh, the ongoing cyber war between Russia and Ukraine. We've got some uh, China's possibility of an invasion of Taiwan and why that might or might not happen. A lot of subjects that I think are, are related to what we're talking about here that uh, are interesting, to say the least. But again, that's all linked in the description below if interested. But thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.